Hi, everybody. Welcome to this. Oh, look, let's do this. Oh, that makes me dizzy. Now we're oh, cooking. Oh, everything's moving. I'm here with Jim Merle and Rob Placone. How old fellas? How are you? Hello. Hey. Stop and paint that white wall. Why can't we just paint it? Anyway, so I know. Can't we paint that white wall? Why don't we paint it? So here we go. Um, we should get another GoFundMe campaign for the wall. We should do one. 20 yeah. bucks. I need 20 bucks to get a can of spray paint. Now, Matt, here, Matt Stoller, who's a great writer, yeah. wrote this in, uh, come on, wrote this in the uh, Washington Post. Uh, it says, Democrats can't win until they recognize how bad Obama's financial policies were. He had opportunities to help the working class, and he passed them up. That's Matt Stoller. Or do you say Stoller? So I, they also, in this article, they had this video of Barack Obama um, from a December, December 16th press conference, and I want to play a little bit of it for you. And it kind of, this is exactly what's, again, what's wrong with the Democrats. Here we go. Is that I can maybe give some counsel advice to the Democratic Party, and I think that... He's going to, so the guy who, by the way, under his eight years, the Democrats are wiped out. Uh, he leaves, he, he's leaving office with a completely decimated party, completely wiped out at every level, and he's going to give them some advice. The thing we have to spend the most time on, because it's the, the thing we have the most control over, is how do we make sure that we are showing up in places where I think democratic policies are needed, where they are helping, where they are making a difference, but where people feel as if they're not being heard. So uh, if, you didn't, if you didn't notice what he just did, I'll tell you what he just did. He just said, the problem isn't the message. The problem is that we're not going out and bringing our message to people. people places where the democratic uh, policies are helping people. That we're not showing up. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. He's not saying that we need new policies or that the country's sick and tired of establishment politics or that, yeah, you know, uh, the Democratic Party got in bed with the rich and powerful and that's who we serve. And that's really the problem. He's trying to pretend, again, the problem is tactic and not the soul of the party. And where Democrats are characterized as coastal, liberal, latte sipping, uh, you know, politically correct, uh, out of touch folks. That sounds like a fucking exactly accurate description. <laughs> that's not that's not some crazy idea people have of Democrats. That's accurate. You guys are latte sipping, in bed with Wall Street, Martha's Vineyard. You're a party of Martha's Vineyard. You're not a party of Allentown, Pennsylvania. That's who the Democrats are. That's accurate. You are a bunch of out of touch, latte sipping, coastal motherfuckers. That's why you're wiped out. You think you th you think you're wiped out because you didn't go to a fish fry, or because half the country's poor, and your fucked up right wing health care plan didn't get anybody out of debt. People still go bankrupt when they get sick in America, left and right. We don't even have a public option. And he still thinks, he still thinks, so go ahead, here's a little bit more. Uh, we have to be in those communities. And I've seen that when we are in those communities, it makes a difference. That's how I became president. Mm -hmm. I became a U.S. senator, not just because... I had a strong base in Chicago, but because I was driving around downstate Illinois and going to fish fries and sitting in VFW halls. And, and actually promising policies that would help people's lives. Because I remember you used to be single payer. I have, a, I have a videotape we played on this show from 2007 when you were telling a room full of people and a room full of union people, you're, un you're going to put on a soft shoe and r help them, and you're for single payer, and you're for card check. That's why you got elected. And then you did none of those things. Look, uh, Jimmy, I'm uh, really tired, and uh, yeah. I'm more likable than the rest of the Democrats. Yeah. And uh, fuck yourselves. Yes. I think that could have been the whole speech. That's I think that's right. all he had to say. And that's why you got reelected, because you know, the, you know the, the rhetoric of populism, and you seem like a real nice guy. You make people feel good when you talk. It's not because how you legislate. So this again, so here, let's go on to Matt Stoller's article. He's so sleepy. Well, I, think, I think he's half right. In 2010, well, if he had if he had a message, 
you know, that's half the half the problem. Yeah, but, but he didn't he, have one. He didn't have one. But also in 2010, we lost the Congress because he didn't use the Democratic uh, apparatus that got him elected to do anything. Before, to, to he disbanded out. his followers. By yeah. the way, as soon as he got into office, he had this coalition of progressives who right. wanted change in America. He disbanded them. Absolutely. So this guy makes a lot of these great same points. Let's get he said the past eight years of policymaking have damaged Democrats at all levels. Recovering Democratic strengths will require the party's leaders to come to terms with what it has become and the role Obama played in bringing it to this point. So in order to get better, we have to come to terms with this. That's why people keep Jimmy is still harping on Obama. We have to come to terms with what's wrong. And we still haven't. Two key elements characterize the kind of domestic policy, political economy the administration pursued. The first was the foreclosure crisis and subsequent bank bailouts. So this is a microcosm of what was wrong with the Barack Obama administration. The resulting policy framework of Tim Geithner's Treasury Department, Tim Geithner, who Barack picked, was in effect a wholesale attack on the American home. Yes, it was. And the American home is the main source of middle class wealth. And they did that in favor of concentrated financial power. That was a decision they did it on purpose, meaning they screwed over homeowners in favor of the richest, most powerful people in the world. That's what that says. That's what they did. No one will fucking say that out loud. The Democrats screwed over homeowners in favor of the banks on purpose as policy. The second was the administration's pro-monopoly policies. Now, we've talked about this with Thomas Frank, who wrote this book, Listen Liberal, and he told us all about how Barack Obama didn't even enforce, oh, he didn't need, he didn't need Congress to enforce the antitrust laws. Doesn't need, those laws are already there, didn't enforce them. Which crushed the, the pro-monopoly policies, which crushed the rural areas in, in, that in 2016 lost voter turnout and swung to Donald Trump. Financial collapses, while bad for the country, are opportunities for elected leaders to reorganize our culture. So that's the po point he makes. Financial collapses are horrible, but they're a chance to reorganize the, co the country's economy. Franklin Roosevelt took a frozen banking system and created the New Deal. Ronald Reagan used the sharp recession of the early 80s to seriously damage unions. In January 2009, Obama had overwhelming Democratic majorities in Congress, $350 billion of no-strings-attached bailout money, and enormous legal latitude. Well, what did he do to reshape the country and get it, uh, get it on its, to reshape a country on its back? Well, rather than forcing some burden sharing between banks and homeowners through bankruptcy reform or debt relief, Obama prioritized creditor rights meaning he made the bank's health a priority over homeowners, placing, in fact, most of the burden on homeowners. This kept big banks functional and ensured that financiers would maintain their position in the recovery. At a 2010 hearing, Damon Silvers, vice chairman of the Independent Congressional Oversight Panel, which was created to monitor the bailouts, told Obama's Treasury Department, quote, we can either have a rational resolution to the foreclosure crisis... Or we can preserve the capital structure of the banks. We can't do both. Meaning we could actually have a rat ra to be a rational response. We should help the homeowners. That would be a rational response. Or if you don't want to be rational, we could also do a thing that preserves the capital structure of the banks. That keeps the banks whole doing what they've been doing and will co keep doing. You can't do both. What did they choose to do? They chose to be irrational on purpose. Barack Obama's Treasury Department and his administration decided to be irrational. That's what Paul Krugman kept writing about in the Wall Street, I mean, in the New York Times. He just wanted a rational response to the economic crisis, and we weren't getting one. So that's what that is. So they, so they admitted, yeah, we're going to screw over homeowners. And the second thing was Obama administrations let big bank executives off the hook for their roles in the crisis. Carl Levin, a Democrat from Michigan, referred criminal cases to the Justice Department and was ignored. Whistleblowers from the government and large banks noted a lack of appetite among prosecutors. In 2012, then-Attorney General Eric Holder ordered prosecutors not to go after megabank HSBC for fucking money laundering. Money laundering through, for drug hundreds of millions of dollars in money laundering. And Eric Holder said, let him go. Don't do anything. Don't even look. 
using prosecutorial discretion to not take bank executives to task while legal was neither moral nor politically wise. Because in a 2013 poll, more than half of Americans still said they wanted the bankers behind the crisis punished. So that's after Barack Obama got reelected, half the country still wanted the bankers held responsible. And they weren't going to be. But the Obama administration failed to act. And this pattern seems to be continuing. No one, for instance, from Wells Fargo has been indicted for mass fraud and opening fake accounts. Third, Obama enabled and encouraged roughly 9 million foreclosures. 9 million foreclosures. He encouraged them. People getting kicked out of their fucking houses. And he didn't help them. He set up a system to help that happen. This was Geithner's explicit policy at Treasury. The Obama administration put together a foreclosure program that it marketed as a way to help homeowners. But when Elizabeth Warren, the chairman of the Congressional Oversight Panel, grilled Geithner on why the program wasn't stopping foreclosures, he said that it wasn't really, that wasn't really the point. We're not trying to stop foreclosures. Foreclosures would be good for the banks. So fuck our American people, fuck the taxpayers, fuck our own citizens. Because Timothy Geithner only cares about the banks, just like Barack Obama. The program, in his view, was working. We estimate that they can handle 10 million foreclosures over time, Geithner said, referring to the banks. The pro- it's been working. They can handle, they can absorb these foreclosures. This... Pr- This program will help foam the runway for them, meaning banks. For Geithner, the most productive economic policy was to get the banks back to business as usual, meaning fucking over everyone in their own self-interest and using taxpayer money to bail them out when they go tits up. Nor did Obama do much about monopolies. While his administration engaged, so that was the bank's and the foreclosure crisis, now monopolies, while his administration engaged in a few mild changes toward the end of his term, 2015 saw a record wave of mergers and acquisitions, and 2016 was another busy year. In nearly every sector of the economy, from pharmaceuticals to telecom to internet platforms to airlines, power has been concentrated under Obama. Concentrated. And, his, and this administration, like George W. Bush's before it, did not prosecute a single significant monopoly under Section 2 of the Sherman Act. That's what Thomas Frank talked about on our show. Who did they go after? Instead, the past few years, the Federal Trade Commission has gone after such villains as music teachers and ice skating instructors for ostensible anti-competitive behavior. This is very much a parallel of the financial crisis as elites operate with, without legal constraints while the rest of us toil under an excess of bureaucracy. So it's cr- crime and punishment for the poor and, and the middle class and it's Katie Bardador for the wealthy. Do, there's criminal class, no, not never held accountable. And people see that. Why do you think they voted for Trump? They wanted to smash you motherfuckers. With these policies in place, it's no surprise that Thomas Piketty and others have detected skyrocketing income inequality. That most jobs created in the past eight years have been temporary or part-time or that lifespans in white America is dropping. When Democratic leaders don't protect the people, the people get poorer, they get angry, and more of them die. Yes, Obama prevented an even greater collapse in 2009. But he also failed to prosecute the banking executives responsible for the housing crisis, then approved a foreclosure wave under the guise of helping homeowners. Though 58% of Americans were in favor of government action to halt foreclosures, Obama's administration said, fuck you to those 58% of Americans, and the voters noticed. Fewer than 4 in 10 Americans were happy with his economic policies this time last year. Only 4 in 10. And that was an all-time high. And by election day, 75% of voters were looking for someone who could take the country back from the rich and powerful. 75% on election day wanted someone to take the country back from the rich and powerful. 
And what did they get? What did the Democrats offer us? One of the richest and most powerful fucking corrupted politicians in the history of our country. Also one of the most hated, second most hated. Here you go. You guys are desperate and in need of a revolution. Here's someone you not only hate their guts, but as an establishment to their bone. Something unlikely to be done by members of the party that let the financiers behind the finances. Was that? Oh, yeah. So they wanted them to take the country back from the rich and powerful, which is something unlikely to be done by members of the party that let the financiers behind the 2008 financial crisis walk free. But they did tell them to play nice. They did tell them to play nice. But the reality is that the Democratic Party has been slipping away from the working class for some time, and Obama's presidency hastened rather than reversed that departure. Republicans, hardly worker-friendly themselves, simply capitalized on it. Many Democrats think that Trump supporters voted against their own economic interests, but voters don't want concentrated financial power that deigns to re redistribute some cash, along with weak consumer protection laws. They want jobs. They want to be free to govern themselves. And Trump is not exactly pitching self-government. But he is offering a wall of sorts to protect voters against neoliberals who consolidate financial power, ship jobs abroad, and replace paychecks with food stamps. His rhetoric offered that anyway. Democrats should have something better to offer working people. They don't. They don't. They are offering them the TPP. They're offering them NAFTA. That's what the Democrats offer them. And a right-wing health care plan that keeps them bankrupt. If they did, they could have won in November. They didn't. That's why they lost in November. In the wreckage of this last administration, they didn't. No, they don't. Go ahead, Phil. So there it is. Thanks, That's Jesus. the two big economic problems. The way Barack Obama handled the foreclosure crisis and how Barack Obama didn't do anything about monopolies the whole, his whole eight years. Go ahead, Jim. Thanks a lot. You just cut my lifespan in half with that depressing segment. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it is depressing. But this is what Democrats have to come to terms with if they want to win going forward. If I might make, make a one point about Obamacare, uh, I would be bankrupt without it. Yeah. Oh no, no you know, doubt. I mean, there, there, there are good points to it. Yeah. No, no. It's, a, it's, it was less than a half measure. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. But you know that that's what the Republicans should have proposed. That's not what a Democrat. When you have right. complete control of government, the Senate, the House, and the presidency, you propose single payer. You know that. Yeah. I have a gammy leg. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's have to constant. So. That's a great article. Matt Stoller is a great writer. That's all correct. And people don't understand that's what happened. I mean, people do. People who don't vote for the Democrats anymore understand. Graham Elwood, who was on this show, and he, when he lost his house during the uh, financial crisis, he knows that the government was effing him over in favor of the banks. He got that loud and clear. Anybody who lost their house knows exactly who runs this country and who they're working for. And that's what's wrong with the Democrats, because the Democrats are still in bed with the people who screwed over this country and are going to continue to screw over the country. And until they get out of bed with those people, it's going to be a eh, nail biter every goddamn election. Well, and for folks concerned about the direction of the Democratic Party that think, you know, we, we can work from within and stuff, they need to realize that Obama was always a center right politician because the whole argument is like well we need to reach across the aisle now and he people were did. tired of well obama was center right to begin with and it didn't work right he already was he already offered them the right wing health care plan come along this is your plan <laughs> yeah he already did move to the right he already he was pro fracking he was pro uh drill he was all the above remember that mm -hmm. he was he was pro tpp he's all, he's all that stuff he already was to the right you guys got your ass handed to you Hey, the next live Jimmy Dore show is March 4th. That's a Saturday. Get your tickets right below. The next one after that is March 20th. The shows sell out really fast, so get your tickets right now. Link's right there.